Uh, the government is, is going to roll out roadside drug testing with the aim of undertaking 50,000 tests per year. This is their aim. I think they'll find it much tougher. Legislation will be introduced later in this year, giving police the power to randomly screen drivers for drugs using oral fluid testing devices, similar to current drink driving enforcement. So this is their plan. Good plans like this always sort of come, come, come right, don't they? Everyone wants impaired and dangerous drivers off the road. That's a no-brainer. But experts have serious concerns about the accuracy of these tests. Uh, Dr. Amy Haley has has been researching roadside drug tests as well as the impact of drugs and alcohol on drivers. So what does her work um, tell us about the reliability of drug uh, side road testing? So in Australia, we've had roadside drug testing for quite some time now. So the police use it as a point of detection for things like cannabis, but also methamphetamine and MDMA. So it's had a bit of a tumultuous history in our country, at least, particularly when it comes to cannabis. Um, given that there are some inconsistencies with the reliabilities of the tests themselves um, and the complexities around you know, the idea of the presence of THC versus the uh, intoxication, so in, implying that the presence of THC is a proxy for uh, intoxication is a really complicated picture. Yeah, because with um, with alcohol testing, um, it's a lot more clear, isn't it? But you often see people caught or or, or, or um, in a, in a road accident, and they say there's um, marijuana in the system, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's caused the accident, does it? No. Well, cannabis or THC is really commonly found in people who have been uh, involved in a collision, so whether they've been hospitalised for an injury or, or death. Um, but that doesn't always tell us the whole story as to whether or not that was the reason for causing the collision. Um, the best approximations we have of responsibility for collision is something called a culpability analysis, and that tells us whether or not someone was likely to be responsible for a crash, um, and if that can be attributed to the presence or the um, yeah, just just having someone having substances in their system. And for cannabis, the risk of a collision for being responsible for a collision um, is you know not really much higher than that for alcohol. Right. So when it comes to that reliability question in, in Australia, uh, a prosecution's thrown out. I mean, how does it work? If it if it's if it's so unreliable, then how come it's in play? So uh, as, far, as far as reliability goes, we know that for like things like false positives, for that's when a test would show up a positive result when there is not found to be any uh, THC in their system when we have a confirmatory analysis. So just to make sure that the point of collection devices at the roadside are just a preliminary test. And then if they test positive on that, people will then have to undergo a blood test for quantification, which will then show us if and how much of a substance is in someone's blood. Um, and so there can be issues of false positives. So this can show up in the, the roadside test when there isn't any confirmed in the quantification. Um, as far as prosecution goes, uh, police will obviously make a case based on both of those sets of evidence um, and then we'll present that to the judge. And it's a complex um, legal, I guess, procedure, which is not entirely my area, but I know that People have been, you know, arguing the case that they might have been taking medicinal cannabis, for example, um, but then that runs up against our roadside drug legislation or road safety legislation, which implies that any presence of a drug is enough for um, prosecution because it, it sort of implies that there's intoxication. Yes, yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Because medicinal cannabis in your country has been legal for some time. In our country, it's now legal as well, number of products, although you have a lot more products. Um, it would seem to me to be pretty tough prosecution if you're on medicinal cannabis for some kind of anxiety or whatever your issue might be, uh, and then to be done on the roads for it. You know, I, I find that a really difficult prosecution. Yeah, as far as the the legal sense is, is as far as the legality of it is concerned at the moment, it's just a, a very black and white. You cannot have any THC in your system, irrespective of if you have a um, prescription for medical cannabis, which of course is, I guess, uh, an antithesis to how we would treat other medications. So things like benzodiazepines, for example, people can drive under the influence of those drugs. Granted, they are not impaired, but that I guess the idea or the concept of impairment is a very complicated one. Um, and at, at the moment, with benzodiazepines, for example, the onus is on the driver to decide whether or not they are too impaired to drive. But with cannabis, uh, people are going to be putting themselves at risk of prosecution. 
just for having taken their prescribed medication that might contain THC. What's the the, the, ben, the benzo thing? The, the, the benzo thing you just mentioned there, that that drug. What is that? Because I think that's that's common here, isn't it? So benzodiazepines are things like Valium or Xanax. So people take them prescribed for things like anxiety um, or also things like sleep disorders, so a short-term fix for things like insomnia. Um, and they can cause significant impairments in driving performance. Our own research has shown that when people consume uh, prescribed amounts of benzodiazepines with a legal amount of alcohol, they are very much more likely to crash a car um, and they're significantly more impaired than either drug alone. But this is quote-unquote legal, so I guess that's where some of the inconsistencies lie with the legislation around medical cannabis. It's a really complicated area, isn't it? It's a really complicated area to um, get right, and for us to introduce something like this, uh, we, you'd have to see it working really well in other jurisdictions, wouldn't you? Yeah, I guess it's been a little bit of a, um, you know, find out by by practice in this country, so we're, we're sort of uh, facing at the moment some complexities around you know, changing, potentially changing the legislation and permitting uh, medical cannabis uh, patients to drive. What that looks like is unclear at the moment. So our own research group is going to be conducting some on-track studies with the oversight of the Victorian state government and looking at people who use medical cannabis and whether they're impaired when we put them in a real car and whether or not we can sort of, I guess, identify and monitor that impairment through different levels of um, like occupant monitoring, so technologies and roadside um, impairment testing as well. What's worse, a driver, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'll throw it your way anyway. What's worse, a driver under the influence of booze or a driver under the influence of marijuana? They're two different sort of risk profiles. Um, so what we often find with people who are intoxicated by alcohol is they have very risky driving behaviors. So people would take more risks around sort of weaving in and out of traffic and just sort of, um, you know, harsh braking, harsh acceleration, speeding, and that sort of evasive driving behavior. Typically what we find with people who have cannabis in their system is they're a little bit more cautious. It might be some something to do with, you know, their awareness of, you know, their intoxicated state, um, but it's also just how the two different drugs might um, affect people's uh, thinking and behavior. It's not to say that cannabis isn't impairing because we know that it can be at certain doses, particularly when people take cannabis recreationally. This is often at doses which are much higher than people use medically, and they're often um, trying to achieve a high. So the THC is consumed purposefully to get that sort of psychoactive effect. Whereas when people are using it medically, that's just simply not really the case. People are using this as a therapeutic, mm. um, usually to alleviate a really serious health concern like um, you know, chronic pain, for example. Exhausted drivers are dangerous. <laughs> Tired drivers are dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. They cause a significant amount of the burden of road trauma. <laughs> yeah. What would be your final message to, uh, to the authorities here in New Zealand if you know if we're looking at this drug test, this roadside drug testing, what would you say? I would say that there are likely to be more adaptive ways that we can work together to try and find um, ways to stop impaired driving. Uh, a roadside saliva test is not necessarily a good or useful proxy for impairment. Um, and also um, conflating impairment with the presence of THC is not entirely useful. And you might find issues when it comes to dealing with medical cannabis patients who deserve to have the same rights as other drivers. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, we'll leave it there. I really appreciate your time, really clear. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks okay. for having Thanks. me. You're very welcome. Thanks, Amy.